Hello, everyone, and I apologize in advance for the technology issue, so please bear with us today. It's been one of those days, but we're having a great conference. I want to introduce myself. My name is Ivory Davis. I am the co-founder of Cannabis Nurses of Color, and today I have the distinct honor of um, moderating this medical panel, and so today you'll hear from um, three fabulous um, doctors, and so we'll go ahead and get started and allow them the opportunity to present themselves. So ladies first, Dr. Knox, if you want to go first. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. It's still morning here on the on the West Coast, but I'm Dr. <laughs> Janice Knox. I am one of four Knox docs. I'm a board certified anesthesiologist where I practiced for 32 years before becoming an endocannabinologist, that person who studies the physiology of the body that cannabis happens to be the most versatile herb to modulate, and a certified cannabinoid medicine specialist. I am so thrilled just to be here and to be on stage with Dr. Dustin Sulak and Dr. Bedard. Awesome. Dr. Sulak? Sure, I'd be happy to introduce myself. So I'm Dustin Sulak. I'm an osteopathic physician, a general practitioner with a background in integrative medicine. And for the last 11 years, I've been practicing in Maine, recommending cannabis to my patients and uh, uh, serving as the medical director for our clinic, uh, which has seen about 18,000 patients in the last decade. We are, um, we're continuing to follow about 8,000 right now, and it's a uh, really rewarding work. I'm also heavily involved in education, uh, both uh, with patient education that we have free on healer.com, as well as uh, training and certification programs in the industry, as well as a book for clinicians that's coming out at the end of June. And uh, I'm really passionate about education and the opportunity to do more of that here today. So thank you for having me. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. So we were, we still have one more panelist coming in. So we'll go ahead and get started. And then we will circle back for introductions when he is able to get in. But today's panel, we're talking about, I think the title is perfect, Building Trust, Engaging in Medical Professional Education. So as we know, we have 36, I think 36 is the last count that I've seen. 36 states um, now have reform, have reform laws on cannabis and organized programs that allow for qualified and registered patients to um, purchase, possess, and to use cannabis for therapeutic use. Um, however, despite these reforms, many physicians do not feel comfortable talking to patients who are using cannabis to treat their health or even to review any of the research that has been um, conducted to learn about how physicians are helping patients to treat a wide range of conditions. So today with our panelists, we'll kind of explore that and kind of dig into what is going on and what can we do um, in the healthcare um, community to try to get more physicians on board. So um, Dr. Knox, I'll start with you first. Um, just to kind of ask you first, if you can give us just your thoughts, first of all, on why you think that, that, that this is still an issue in the community. Absolutely. You know, being a conventional medicine doctor, an allopathic physician, you know, that is a special kind of culture. And I really didn't believe, I didn't realize how much of a culture it was until you start looking at it from a business perspective. And what I found out is that we are so, so mired in the traditional way medicine is practiced from clinical research, improving a, a product or something works to just our own personal views about cannabis. We all st are still living under the stigma of, you know, what was, what that was created with reefer madness. We all have a degree of that going on. But that, with that being said, with the discovery of the endocannabinoid system and the history of cannabis as it traveled or journeyed through our country, at least anyway, there is plenty of science and research that's been done that should change our minds away from that stigma. The thing is, we have to convince our colleagues of that very conventional culture that this is something real. They're still saying there's not enough research or, you know, we don't know anything about it. It's, you know, and it's federally illegal, at least THC is, that's federally illegal still. So we're hiding behind licenses and, and state board regulations and let alone having to go back and learn something. So I think all those things 
or preventing clinicians from jumping in. And I happen to believe clinicians should be leading the way. Practitioners should be leading the way. Our patients are using it. They're going to come to us and ask us about it. What right. answers are we going to give them? Are we going to tell them not enough research or don't tell me about it, do what you're doing, but I'm going to turn my head this other way. To me, that's no longer viable. I think medical legally, they should be encouraged to learn something. I live in Oregon, and I remember years ago as an anesthesiologist, when our state board mandated that we learn more about treating patients with narcotics. They would not re re renew our licenses unless we took courses because they thought we weren't giving patients enough narcotic for pain control. No, I'm not for one for uh, being told or mandated to do something, but mm -hmm. we're going to use this. Should we step in and tell those state boards, offer the, uh, the, uh, the clinicians the, the education, let it be their choice, but put it out there, not mandated, but it should be out there. And I think once the state boards do that, you're going to find a lot of clinicians who are probably more willing to come over and learn something about about cannabis therapy. Absolutely. So Dr. Sulak, when are the state boards going to do that? Ah, good question. Well, what would be their incentive uh, to do so? You know, I think that's a big problem in medicine right now is that the incentive structure really isn't there in, in many ways to do what's best for patients. You know, and I think doctors are typically burned out and very risk adverse. And in that kind of a state, um, it's hard to get them to learn something new, even if, uh, I mean, I think what I've seen uh, being a, a clinical educator is that there are certain doctors from every other field in medicine and whether it's anesthesiology or nephrology, neurology, psychiatry, it doesn't matter. Like there are people in those fields realizing that cannabis is a potent solution, not only for their patients, but also for their career. And, uh, and realizing that uh, developing some expertise in this and getting good at recommending cannabis to patients and, and getting good outcomes with ca uh, patients using cannabis doesn't take years of study. I mean, it can be mm -hmm. relatively uh, rapid, um, you know, and streamlined. Now, the, the educational offerings out there are really excellent. And so, I, you know, I think that outside of these select few that are kind of coming over to this emerging new specialty field, we have the rest of medicine that would rather just say, yeah, I'm going to send my patient to Dr. Knox or Dr. Sulek. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to um, learn about it. Uh, you know, it's it's just a sad state of medicine right now, burned out, closed-minded, overwhelmed and uh, and ready to kind of outsource anything new and exciting to people like us and and I don't I don't think that uh, we're gonna see state medical boards or uh, the federal medical board commission really change anything uh, until there's a, a lot of demand within our um, you know profession and I think that's still pretty far off you know and and then, I'm, you I'm have, sorry go ahead you have a great point but I do think once you tell clinicians, and we're seeing more and more come over, you know, there's no question to that, but certainly not enough. The number of patients using this is just escalating and we don't have the providers to address them. But I think when you talk about at least, you know, the, my profession, my colleagues, you know, if, if the state boards would say, you know what, you can be liable for not understanding the medications your patients are on and they're taking cannabis and the possible drug drug interactions. Why don't you know this? You know, not to know it is a liability. Absolutely. And perhaps we need to approach them from that perspective. This could be a medical legal liability for you to not know something at least. And it's okay with me if they know, well, I'm going to send it to this person over here, this doctor over here that does know about it. What I object to is they're sending them to the bud tenders to get the information because they mm -hmm. don't know. And that's where, to me, the biggest, the biggest crime exists. Doctors should not be sending patients to the dispensaries to get that education. Yeah or to get that, you know, um, that, that information on dosing, we should not, I mean, we should be embarrassed that that mm -hmm. is happening. And then one more quick response. I'm sorry, no, Ivory, but I think, no, you know, ahead. and we've talked about this before, Janice, I, you know, I think one of the turning points may be when there's a malpractice suit <laughs> against a physician that does not recommend cannabis, you oh, know, that has right. not properly evaluated the risk benefit ratio of all the options, including cannabis and elects for a, a more risky, less likely effective treatment instead of cannabis and the patient's harmed and the patient comes back and uh, sues the doctor. Like that's going to make headlines. We're, 
we're all in the field waiting for this. And I'm sure that there's been many patients in that uh, situation that have been harmed uh, by not being offered cannabis. Take a look at all the uh, patients with chronic pain that have been treated with opioids. You know, what if half or all of them were offered cannabis first? I mean, there would be a different place right now. You you both um, hit on something very important, and, and it was about the physicians, like the primary treating uh, physicians, like referring to you, either or you. And do you think my so my question is, do you think that competency for the for the physicians is an issue? And if so, what core um, core areas of competency in cannabis medicine do you feel that it's important for physicians to really learn and have a grasp on to feel comfortable um, in the space? I'll start off and I think that's really important. My husband is an emergency room physician, physician and the number of patients that have gone into the emergency room with overuse of cannabis because they ate a whole cookie because they didn't understand, you know, eating a whole cookie and the onset was going to be for two hours and then they're blown away and they end up in the emergency rooms. He's seen that. And those statistics go against what we're trying to practice, right? The safe use and, and clinical responsibility of using cannabis. But if those ER physicians understood the physiology and understood more about the pharmacology of the plant, a lot of those patients will not end up in the ICU only to go home the next day. Uh, so there is a basic competency I do think they need to have, the basic physiology, understanding the endocannabinoid system and how it functions, understanding how the cannabis or the various cannabinoids work on that endocannabinoid system. So if you have a patient coming in that has, you know, ate a whole cookie full of THC, you know, you're not going to put them in ICU unless they're having some cardiac symptoms or something like that. You're going to put them in a nice corner, play them some nice music and, you know, get them through that, that session. But because they don't understand it, the first thing about the physiology or how cannabis affects the, that, that physiology, we're seeing just, just I, I think, poor care. Just, so just, the, just competent enough to understand the basics. Mm -hmm. And I, you agree with that, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't have much to add, but, you know, listening to your response, Janice, you know, I'm just thinking about how sad it is that our colleagues don't even know about the endocannabinoid system and uh, its potential in their, pay. I mean, it's just, you know, our, our profession is really in a sad state right now that we've known about this physiologic system for 30 years and the vast majority of our colleagues have uh, never heard of it or, or know nothing about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I have an example. I went into the um, into short stay with my husband to do some minor thing or other. And the uh, anesthesiologist came in and he asked me, you know, what do you do? And I told him, well, I was a retired anesthesiologist. And I say, now I call myself an endocannabinologist. And he looked at me. He said, oh, that is really cool. That is so cool. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, do you, do you know what that is? And he said, no. <laughs> How is it cool if you, cool, don't, yeah. if you don't understand what, the, what it is? <laughs> and so, you know, anesthesiologists, we do physiology and pharmacology. It, to me, at least understand something about this plant. You know, oftentimes mm -hmm. patients will call me, should I stop my, my cannabis before going into surgery? Anesthesia is a perfect place to do a study for whether or not you should use CBD. I, as an anesthesiologist, probably would have used a CBD a week before and a week after, understanding the implications. But that'll be a perfect place for us to understand how to use these cannabinoids preoperatively for stress, inflammation, postoperative to decrease, you know, opioid needs. Perfect place, but we have to get these guys to buy into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to ask the audience, we'll, we'll be wrapping up here shortly, but if you have any questions, please um, put them in the chat. I'm going to be looking at the, at the chat in just a second here, but while I have a brief minute, I just want to ask, because while we're talking about the issues and the barriers, let's talk more on, I guess, how can we solve it? What organizations or institutions do we need to get involved to help doctors get on board? Who, who, who are the bodies that we need to, or the entities that we need to engage? Well, I could go first on that one. I mean, I think the biggest way to change the system is from within. And I think every patient that visits any doctor for any reason is uh, facing an opportunity there to help educate that doctor and, and change the profession. Uh, and how to educate, I mean, start off by telling stories. You know, if, if cannabis has helped you, don't hide that from your clinician. Share that. Not only is it good for your care, for your providers to know about that. In most situations, you know, I guess the, the caveat is that sometimes it can damage the rapport 
or or the relationship if if your provider is strongly biased against cannabis but if that's the case you probably want to change providers anyways but um bring them in articles uh you know selfishly i'll suggest buying a copy of my book as a present for your doctor uh you, you know um or on you know or uh, we have a, a basic like nine page document on healer.com that uh, you know is all, all the things doctors that don't know about cannabis would want to know if they're taking care of a, a cannabis using patient. You know, it's every encounter is an opportunity. And then you know, separate from that, I think a really high impact area for change, which I'm not sure exactly how to uh, foster this change, has to do with the examinations that doctors take. Um, so their their board exams uh, to get through medical school and to get through licensure are really. Um, uh, they, those exams dictate the curriculum. And so if we're wondering why do medical schools not include this in the curriculum, the answer is because it's not on the exam. And if we could change that, then the curriculum would change. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Knox, did you want to have anything to add to, to that one before I go to the chat? Yeah, I have one just a sort of fun thing. I love starting with the history forever. The history is so important because it's sort of gives everyone a foundation to build that knowledge on. When they realize what happened in this country with cannabis, that it was eliminated from the American Pharmacopeia, not because of research or science, but because of industrialists and, you know, politicians and, and ideologues, you know, I try to make them feel like they've been cheated out of something. <laughs> and when people feel like they've been cheated out of something, then they're galvanized. Oh, I'm getting that yeah. back. So I love doing that with my colleagues, taking them through that exercise and then taking them through how the endocannabinoid system was discovered and then what the system does for the total person, not just the heart or the lungs, but the, 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 the unified human being from spirituality to any physical process going on. Absolutely. The, in the chat, this is not a question, but I thought it was a, um, a good point uh, made by Michelle. She said it would be great if there was some kind of liaison that could facilitate those referrals and collaborate with physicians and specialists. And um, I think her question is cut off, but basically someone, a, a doorkeeper. Um, and when and, and as a nurse, I, I'll say that a, a lot of times that's how nurses can be utilized to kind of help with the flow. But I thought that was a good point that Michelle brought up for somebody to try to be the liaison to try to help get, um, you know, it, until for sure, until we get more docs um, on board, especially um, uh, primary doctors on board to help facilitate that process. I was ch um, checking through the chat one last time just to see if there were any other questions. Um, I didn't see any other questions. Um, let me make sure here. So a lot of statements um, and a lot of agreement from the audience. They pretty much agree and concur with um, what, what the experts are telling us. So we appreciate um, you guys for taking the time. And right here at the end, I think we have a special guest that has joined us and i'll let him introduce himself and give us um some expertise here for a second yeah i'm dr larry bedard i'm a retired emergency physician i've been in medical politics my entire career became president of the american college of emergency physicians and in 2009 i came out of the cannabis closet and asked the california medical association to support legalization Took two years, but in 2011, the CMA's Board of Trustees unanimously approved legalization. And then in 2016, uh, I was on the ballot writing a rebuttal to Senator Feinstein. Uh, uh, I've been following the discussion. I had obviously problems getting on. Uh, I'm also a public official, sit on the Marin Healthcare District, and we oversee the management. So a couple of years ago in 2016, after we legalized it, I asked the uh, hospital administrator and chief of staff, uh, gee, I'd like to have a resolution developing policies and procedures for inpatient use of cannabis. Administrator said, come on, Donald Trump will just take where a medical provider number. The thing that really surprised me is the chief of staff said, hey, 90% of our physicians know nothing about cannabis. And quite frankly, they're not interested in learning. And I think that is a huge issue. You know, by and large, patients know much more about cannabis than their family practitioner or their internist. 
uh, and I've heard some of the discussions. I can tell you in my career in uh, the CMA and elsewhere, by and large, physicians are opposed to any kind of educational mandates because, you know, this year was pain management, five years ago was AIDS, uh, you know, this is domestic violence, and you got a pathologist said, hey, I haven't written a prescription in a year, I just deal with dead people. So there's this kind of blanket prohibition from having the state legislature mandate uh, what physicians uh, need for education. Uh, and then it turns out, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, there's a, something like only 9% of medical schools in 2017 had a program on the endocannabinoid system. But guess what? Mm -hmm. we said, gee, we want a 10 hour series of lectures on the endocannabinoid system. Some other professor with his pet project and, you know, uh, whatever, neuroscience, he's not willing to have his teaching hours cut. So that, that's another problem in talking to people at the university. It's pretty cutthroat uh, how often and how many hours you get, uh, you know, to promote your program, whether you're a pediatrician or a neurosurgeon. And Dr. Bedard, picking up on that, that was one of the questions, and I'll um, briefly ask each of the panelists that. More so, just from an overall strategy plan, how do we get the education into medical school training? programs. I guess that will happen more on a, I'm not sure if it's an individual or more on a national scale, um, but how do we get it into medical school training programs? Well, I, first of all, I think it's going to come from public demand. So I would suggest you write to your uh, uh, medical schools in your community. I, I mean, I went from the University of Michigan. I would write them gee, are you doing research on cannabis? And can you please refer me to a physician on your staff who would recommend medical cannabis? I would do the same thing. Uh, you know, most medical associations are organized geographically. So I'm a member of the San Francisco we're in Medical Society and I encourage patients, oh, every state medical society or county medical society has a physician finder program. So, you know, that's one of the reasons you join, you get new patients. So I would hit those physician finders and say, gee, give me the name of three physicians who will write me a recommendation for PTSD for medical cannabis. So uh, now we had a program to educate our physicians. Like I say, they didn't want to participate. The thing they absolutely would refuse is to have a public program where we educate the public and invite physicians because they know so little by and large, they didn't want to be embarrassed by patients or potential patients knowing more than they did. So you go, you go. I, yeah, I think you got to educate uh, physicians separately as a medical staff. Uh, we're working on that at uh, Marin General Hospital now, but boy, the, they're really dragging their feet. And, uh, I'll, I'll tell it here. My family is working on trying to create a subspecialty called endocannabinology. And we're working with an accredited university to get that as an offering. The other thing we're doing is working with a couple of the, 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 um, the um, uh, medical schools like Meharry and, um, what is that? I think Meharry is the first one we're working with, uh, trying to get that education into their medical schools. So we're working real hard to get a foot in the door so that offering is there. I have a feeling until Big Pharma decides it's big enough for them to get into, and then I think it'll get into the medical schools, but we need to start before then. And we really do think the science, the physiology comes before the pharmacology. So we think learning about the endocannabinoid system and the bigger picture, the endocannabinoid ohm is very important. And then we can you know, address how cannabis, which is, just happens to be the most versatile herb that works on this system. There's other things, and we need to know about all of the above. So our approach is to create try to create a subspecialty in endocannabinology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Dr. Sulak, do you, did you have anything you want to add? And we'll get to the last question before we do closing remarks. No, I, I don't think I have anything to add to that. Thank you. Okay. Well, let me ask you this then. So now that cannabis is legal in more states, people are becoming more comfortable sharing their use. However, we're seeing these inflated numbers used in adverse ways. How do we address the 
the adverse ways and really the stigma that's still associated? Ah, great question. I mean, how have we addressed it over the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years? I, you know, I think it's, it's a gradual process of, um, you know, it's not just the stoner or the hippie or the whatever it's, you know, it's the professional, it's, it's every walk of life. And I think that as we, um, you know, we come out of the closet, so to speak, especially in, like I was mentioning before, in the context of our medical encounters, when we interact with the system, uh, hold your cannabis use uh, with pride and not with shame, and uh, speak about it uh, intelligently and and offer to you know provide resources. I think it's it's just such a gift. Um, you know, it's, the the patients are suffering, the providers are suffering, the administrators are. Everybody there can uh, learn a little bit about cannabis and benefit from it. So I think it's the same mission we've always had. It's uh, it's speaking and uh, connecting, and you know, it's it's easy enough when someone has a bias and you bring up cannabis and their you know, fear response triggers and you can tell they're in that fight or flight system and they're really closed minded. Of course, that's not a good time for anybody to learn anything. And so I think it makes sense for us to be sensitive to the people we're talking to and not try to beat our uh, agenda into them even if they're not receptive. So my advice is to make a real connection uh, and then present the cannabis. Don't, you don't just have to go out there throwing it in everybody's face. And anecdotal studies, stories are important. We try to poo-poo those, but anecdotal studies are important stories. Those stories are important. And I encourage all my patients to be transparent, talk about what their families, talk about with their clinicians, because I think that, that is where the push is gonna come from. If we wanna get rid of that stigma, we're gonna have to encourage people to admit that they're using this product and it's working for them. So tell them how you're using it and, and what it's doing for you. I think that's, that's how we're gonna get rid of it. Well, I would think we really need to promote the science, the facts, and the truth. I mean, every professional medical society, uh, including my own, oh, we need more research. We need more research. Uh, cannabis is one of the most researched drugs in the history of the planet. There are 15,000 studies between 1979 and 2015. And the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine said conclusive proof cannabis is beneficial for chronic pain and nausea due to chemotherapy. The vast majority of doctors don't know. So I think ASA or other organizations ought to develop a sheet for their patients where the patient says, gee, I've suffered from chronic uh, pain due to a back injury. And by the way, uh, National Academy of Medicine said there's conclusive evidence and here's 50 studies that will show you it's helpful. So uh, I would prepare documents to have patients educate their physicians and quote the science. The other fact is, gee, you know, we're going to see 500% increase in cannabis use in Colorado and teenagers will be killing people on the roads, etc. And if you look at that data, actually it almost either doesn't go up or slightly drops. There hasn't been this incredible increase in violence or auto accidents. So I think we just need to continue educate physicians, the public, legislatures, that cannabis is for, it's been used for like 10,000 years, one of the safest drugs known to man. Never ever a history of anybody died of a drug overdose from cannabis because it doesn't suppress your respirations. So uh, I think we just need to really uh, promote the science, get the facts out. I agree. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh my God, this has been a wonderful session and I can go on and on and on, but in the interest of time, we will wrap it up. But before we wrap it up, I just want to say again, thank you. Thank you um, to um, Americans for Safe Access for the opportunity. Thank you for the thoughtful questions too that came from the chat. And last but not least, thanks for the panelists for taking the time out of their schedules today to share and to educate us on how we can be better advocates. Before we um, wrap up, I'll give you guys maybe 30, 45 seconds um, to give us just a closing remarks and we will wrap it up from here. 
Well, I'll go first. You know, I, I think that we're all um, in this living in the same world that's full of new challenges in the last year, and it, it can be really overwhelming. And I think that a lot of us uh, emerge from that and, and uh, soothe ourselves with the idea of opportunities to make this world a better place. And uh, cannabis is one opportunity, one really big transformative agent in this world right now. And the way to um, continue to liberate it and get it out there is through uh, you know, uh, compassionate communication and education. And so that's what we're doing here today, but don't let it stop today. Take it with you and, and keep doing it every day. And I'm sure you'll feel better. And for me, and, and I, I resonate with so much you said, Dustin, but for me, looking at it from a 50,000 foot view and understanding the entourage effect and all of that has made me realize how the universe and the world works. And it's really fun to reconnect people to what's real, the patterns and rhythms of life, of humankind. And I think that's what cannabis and understanding how it works has done for me. It made me appreciate reunification of the total body to the earth and to the universe. And if people look at it like that, I think you'll have a whole different perspective. Because it's done something that we had, we unwillingly or unknowingly did was divide and silo everything. It's a reunification. And cannabis is going to heal the world if we're willing to listen. Uh, I think we really need to continue and get more involved in the legislative process of the 38 states that have legalized either recreational and or medical cannabis, there's only one state in which the state medical association, i.e. California, supported it. Uh, you know, I think we ought to be supporting uh, Senator Schumer's uh, in the legislation that's being introduced in the Senate. Uh, uh, I think one of the things we ought to be writing letters to compassionate Joe Biden uh, uh, basically saying, hey, uh, by legislative edict, he can remove cannabis from Schedule 1, and I think that would be a, a major milestone into having it accepted as basically an herbal medicine with virtually no significant medical risk or adverse effect other than maybe a little drowsiness and you shouldn't be using a chainsaw or driving your car if you're stoned. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Nurse Ivory. <laughs> you're fabulous. Thank I you. Sorry, sorry it took you so long. <laughs> That's okay.